Hey guys, welcome to part one of section 2.1 and 2.2. I'm going to record, uh, or I'm going to talk about both of these sections in the same video, but I'm going to split it up by parts. So this is a section on linear equations with one variable. Let's get started. So here's some general advice on solving word problems, because that's what we're going to start with. So the first thing you should always be thinking of is to either make a picture or a diagram whenever relevant or whenever possible. Maybe that would have been a better word to use here. The second thing, and this is, I'm always conflicted between which should come first as a piece of advice, always, always, always define your variables. So what that means is if you're saying that, you know, you're looking for a number, well then always start the question with let X be that number we're looking for. If let's say you're looking at the prices of movie tickets for adults versus children. So define your variable for the price of the adult ticket to be A, and then for the child's ticket be C. So pick relevant variables, but always, always, always define them. Don't just assume that the reader or me in particular is going to know what variables you're choosing and why you're choosing them. Uh, this is also fairly important. So again, I don't know if maybe all of these should have just been called 1A, 1B, 1C, 1D, but you should try to read the problem in chunks or blocks. And I'll explain what this means in a bit as well. So try not to read the whole thing and then get overwhelmed and say, I hate word problems. It's really quite not bad. Uh, as long as you follow this, this piece of advice and you read it in chunks or blocks. And then remember the phrases that come up next. So let's get into those phrases. So these are some phrases that, you know, will help you turn uh, a statement or a problem that you're given into a mathematical equation. So whenever you see added to sum of, you know, the sum of a number and five, uh, in addition to, sometimes it might just say plus, or more often than not, it'll say more than. So whenever you read these phrases or these blocks or these chunks, you should be thinking of a plus sign or addition. Whenever you see difference of, difference between, uh, minus, and now these two I wrote in red for a particular reason. I'll explain this reason later, but you always want to be careful with less than and subtracted from. These are the only two that cause us the most amount of grief. So please, please, please either put stars next to them, but whenever you read word problems, make sure you're, you have a special part of your brain just looking out for less than and subtracted from. These are the two biggest offenders and two biggest traps for students. So whenever you see these phrases, you're looking for a subtraction or a minus. Whenever you see product of multiplied by or times, these are less uh, of an issue in my experience. So whenever you have these things, you're looking for a multiplication. And whenever you see quotient of divided by, or maybe just over O V E R, you should be thinking of division or fractions. Whenever you see equals, I mean, that should be very obvious or just is, you know, two times a number is seven. So is just implies equals results in comes out to gives all these things mean that you should be writing down an equal sign. So let's practice this, see what happens if we come up with an example. So we have four more than five times a number is the quotient of the number and three. And we're looking for this number. What is that number that makes this happen? So here is how I read these problems. And it's always kept me out of trouble. So what I mean by reading by blocks or chunks is the moment you read. So the first time around I read these, I always underline the major phrases that I need to be careful of. So more than times is quotient of, you know, so these are the first things that I underline, and then I make vertical lines or chunks, so that I can essentially solve this problem in blocks. So four more than well, I'm going to have to do something with that. Well, what is four more than it's more than five times a number. Stop there or pause reading there is that means there's going to be an equal sign here. The quotient of well, what two things am I dividing a number or the number and three. So it's the quotient of the number and three. And then we have the final question, what is the number itself that we're looking for? So 
let's see how we how I would approach this problem to be methodical so that I don't make a mistake. It's really very simple if you slow down and just read this in blocks or chunks. Don't try to do too much at the same time. Don't try to take too big a bite of an apple and then get stuck. So first, we define our variable. Let x be the number we're looking for. So now, for more than means, I have to do for plus. If it's for more than something else. Now, five times a number that means five times x, because x was the number that we were looking for. Is just means equal. The quotient of a number and three. So I'm dividing a number by three, so x over three. So if we were to put all this to basically together, we get four plus five times x is just five x. Is, so equals, the quotient of the number and three x over 3. So now this equation is what we can solve in order to find the number we're looking for. So here's a trick that you can use for solving equations. Now please, please, please be careful with this. You can multiply any equation by any number you want as long as you do it to every single term. What you're not allowed to do is choose sides or choose favorites or pick favorites. What you do to one term, you have to do to every single term. Now, the reason why I would want to do that here is because I personally don't like fractions. I'm not afraid of them. I just don't like them. I'm not afraid of broccoli. I just don't like it. Now, students all too often come into this class with this irrational fear of fractions, especially in equations. And I'm trying to tell you it's super easy. As long as you remember this phrase, all terms. So what would happen if we were to multiply every single term by three? So four is one term, five X is another term, X over three is another term. So if you multiply every single term by three, four times three gives us 12, five X times three gives us 15 X. Now notice that this three cancels with this three. So you're just left with that, left behind with X. The reason I did this is because I didn't want to deal with this fraction the entire time. Now, there are other ways of solving this problem where you could have just started by moving this 5x over to the right-hand side by using the inverse operation of addition. So you could have subtracted the 5x over and then taken common denominators and done that whole jazz. Now, if you want to do that, all power to you. You're more than welcome to do that. However, I found that when I've explained this approach to students, they've made the fewest amount of mistakes. So multiply every single term by this denominator or the denominator that you're trying to get rid of. And again, as long as you do to every single term, life is easy. You get to this equation and now if you notice, there are no fractions left. So at this stage, we want to get all the variables to one side. So we can take this 15x because it's being added on the left-hand side. If I were to pick it up and move it to the right, I would subtract it. So we subtract 15x from the left. And when we do that, we can combine like terms on the right-hand side. x minus 15x is negative 14x. And at this stage, hopefully everyone's kind of home free. We can divide the negative 14 over to the left-hand side, reduce this fraction by 2. 2 goes into, six, or two goes into 12 six times. 2 goes into 14 7 times. So we're left with x equals negative 6 over 7. Now this is not our solution. I'll repeat myself and listen carefully. This is not our solution. This is a potential solution. So if we look back at what we've just done, we translated the, the word problem that we were given into a mathematical equation. So that was pretty easy, as long as we know to chunk it or solve it in blocks. We solved the equation using the ideas that we discussed in the formula section. And those ideas were essentially, were essentially just um, inverse operations. Now again, I wrote this word in red because it's quite important. When you solve an equation like this, what you're finding is a potential solution. You don't know if this number is truly a solution to the equation you solved or not until you plug it back into the original equation. 
So how exactly do you know if a potential solution is really a solution or not? Well, you take x equals negative 6 over 7, or whatever x would have turned out to be, and plug it into the original equation. When you do, you get 4 plus 5 times negative 6 over 7. So instead of x, we replace it with negative 6 over 7. And then negative 6 over 7 divided by 3. That goes on this side. Now you're going to have to do this on an assessment, like a quiz or a test if I ask you to. So I'm going to leave this uh, fraction chasing around to you to figure out, or you to verify that you do indeed end up with here. But I'm going to continue from here. We're left with negative 2 over 7 equals negative 2 over 7. And that sounds like a true statement to me. If we had, let's say, 5 equals 5, that would be true. What I mean by a true statement is, well, let's think about a false statement first. Uh, 7 equals 12. Well, that's false, because 7 does not equal 12. But if we were to say 7 equals 7, that would make it true, because 7 does indeed equal 7. So that's what we mean by a true statement. So by plugging in the potential solution, or solutions, we might have more than one, into the original question, or the original equation, we can expect one of three outcomes. So whenever we're solving linear equations in one variable, there's a couple of things that can happen. You can either solve the equation, and you could be left with a variable equals a number. And that's exactly what happened here. We were left with a variable equals some number. Now, if you were to take this number and plug it into the original equation, you may or may not get a true statement. If you get a true statement, you have one solution. And that solution is that number you found, x equals negative 6 over 7. Now, what we have not seen an example for, but it's about to show up soon, is what happens if there are no variables left over. So here, we were left over with a variable, x on one side and a number on the other. That's what I mean by variable equals a number. Well, what happens if there's no variables left over, meaning there's just numbers on both sides? Here is where we can get a number equaling a number could either be true, meaning 7 equals 7, 12 equals 12, 0 equals 0, or we could get a false statement, something like 5 equals 7, 3 equals negative 4, 0 equals 12. So those are obviously false statements. So always, 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 I would maybe even put this, put a star next to this, always keep perspective about if you're solving a linear equation in one variable, these are the three possible choices, or these are the three possible outcomes. You're either left with one solution, a variable equaling a number. We'll talk about the number of solutions left over here in a bit, but you could just have no variables left over, and if no variables are left over, you either have a true statement or you have a false statement. There's no kind of mixing stuff. There's no halfway in the middle. You can't have something that's partially true and partially false. So let's take a look at a couple more examples. So we have 5 less than twice a number is 10 more than the quotient of the number and 4. So again, the first thing we do is we define our variable. Let x be the number that we're looking for. And now we read in chunks. So I should have underlined this, but let's actually do it together. So less than is a phrase that we need to care be careful of. Twice kind of means multiplication by two. Is means equal. More than means I have to add. The quotient of means I have to divide. And that's it. So now here's why I said uh, when I put less than and subtracted from in red on the second or third slide from the beginning, here's why I did that. In all of mathematics, we write the statements as we read them, except for those two phrases. So the moment you see less than or subtracted from, you have to write uh, the opposite order in which you read. So let's think about an example. Let's say we had, uh, let's say I have $100 and Sam has $12 less than me. Now, if we wanted to find out how much money Sam has, would we do 12 minus 100, or would we do 100 minus 12? I'll repeat my question. I have $100. Sam has $12 less than me. 
So who do you think has more money, me or Sam? Hopefully you said me and you'd be right. The reason for that is if Sam has $12 less than me, whatever money I have, if I were to take $12 away from it, I would figure out however much money Sam has. So if I have $100 and Sam has $12 less than the amount of money that I have, in order to figure out how much money Sam has, I would need to evaluate 100 minus 12. So if we have five less than, here I cannot write five minus. So I have to keep an empty box here for something to go here, and then less than five, I have to put a minus sign. Whatever comes before the less than actually has to get written after the minus sign. And whatever is written after the less than has to go before the minus sign. Now, if this were more than, life goes on exactly the way it is. So five plus two times the number, so two X. So if this were any other phrase, the product of five and a number, five times X. Only when we have less than and subtracted from do we have to reverse the order in which things are written. So moving on, twice a number means 2x, 2 times x. Is just means equal. 10 more than means 10 plus. The quotient of a number and 4 just means x divided by 4. So putting all this stuff together, we get 2x minus 5. So going back again, 5 is less than twice a number. So the 2x has to come first. Less than implies the minus sign, and then the 5 comes second. So that's why we're left with 2x minus 5. And then we have is 10 more than, so 10 plus, the quotient of the number and 4. The quotient of the number and 4. So again, we have a nice easy equation, but I have this one fraction here that I don't like. And in order to get rid of this fraction, what I can do is I can multiply every single term by 4. Again, I cannot pick choose pick or choose favorites. I Whatever I do to this term, I have to do to all the terms in the problem. So if I multiply 4 by each term, I get 8x minus 20 equals 40. And then here the 4s cancel. So we're just left with x. Now, so going from here to here, we just simplified, just distributed the 4 in or multiplied the 4 into each term. And now what we can do is to try to get the variables on the same side and all the other stuff on the other side, I am adding the x on the right hand side. So the inverse operation, if I were to pick it up and move it to the left hand side, will be subtraction. The 20 is being subtracted on this side. So if I were to pick it up and move it over, the inverse operation would be addition. So that's exactly what I did. So at this stage, we get 7x equals 60. And because the operation between 7 and x is multiplication, the opposite operation or the inverse operation would simply be division. So all we have to do is just divide the 7 over to the other side. And that will leave us with 60 over 7. And now, hopefully you remember or are careful with the idea that this is a potential solution. We don't know if this is a solution or not. And the only way to be sure is to go back and check it in the original word problem. So twice a number, twice of 60 over 7, 2 times 60 over 7 is 120 over 7. And now we're doing 5 less than this number. So 5 less than 120 over 7, and I want you to verify this yourself, so I left the details out, is going to be 85 over 7. Now again, a friendly reminder, you're going to have to do these checks on assessments so please don't just ignore these because they're fractions. Make sure you practice this stuff. Uh, moving on, the quotient of a number and 4, 60 over 7 divided by 4 will give you 15 over 7. And again here, I left out some of the details because I want you to be able to do this yourself. So please verify that that indeed is the case. And if we add 10 to that number, 15 over 7, we get 85 over 7. And that's exactly what we got on the left-hand side. So 85 over 7 equals 85 over 7. We have a true statement. So when we plug this number into the original equation or into the original word problem, we get a true statement at the end. And when that happens, we know that this number, 
has gone from being a potential solution to being a solution to the equation. So, oh, this is exactly what I have in the next slide. So since this number results in a true statement, when plugged into the word problem, we can say that it is indeed a solution. So the number that we're looking this entire time for was or is 60 over 7. So a couple of common themes that emerge in these uh, in this section or in word problems at this level are consecutive numbers. So consecutive numbers are numbers that come one right after the other. So 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, so on and so forth. These are consecutive numbers. So this is how I guess I want you to think about it, that if x is the first number, so if 3 is represented by x, the next number after x is going to be x plus 1. So here's another question that you can ask yourself if you're having trouble with this. What do I have to do or what do you have to do to 3 to get to 4? Hopefully you're saying just add 1. Now what do you have to do to 4 to turn it into 5? Well, add 1 but from 4. So what happens if the original number, the first number that we were talking about was x? How would I go from x to the next number? Well, x plus 1. And how would I go from x plus 1 to the next number? x plus 1 plus 1. So that's what I have here. So again, if we were to talk about, say, three consecutive numbers doing something, if the first number is x, the second number must be x plus 1. The third number, x plus 1 plus 1, has to be x plus 2. And hopefully this makes sense as well, because 3, turning, uh, turning a 3 into a 5 requires us to add 2 to the original number. So now, hopefully this kind of makes it slightly easier for you to at least create your own equation. But always, always, always remember this phrase. And if you uh, initialize your variables as it's known in computer science, or if you just define your variables as it's known in mathematics, life becomes way easier. Now, what happens if we have something uh, to do with consecutive even numbers? So these are numbers like 8, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18, so on and so forth. So if the first number is x, the first even number is x, the next even number after that is not x plus 1, because that would be an odd number. So if the first number is 8, the next number, if you were to just add 1 to it, would end up being 9. And that would not be a consecutive even number. Those would just be consecutive numbers. So you have to be very careful with whether the question is asking for consecutive numbers or consecutive even numbers or consecutive odd numbers. Uh, what kind of consecutive numbers are they? Are they just plain vanilla ones or are they anything special with even or odd? So if the first number that's even is x, how do you go from x to the next even number? How do you go from 8 to 10? Hopefully you're saying, well, you add 2, and you'd be right. Now how, and I left this as a question mark for you guys to work on, if you're adding 2 to go from the first even number to the second one, what do you think you need to add in order to go from the first even number to the third one? What would you need to do if, let's say, you had to go to a fourth even number? So think about these questions because they end up showing up quite easily or quite often on easy quizzes and tests. Now, this one I left as an exercise for you guys because it, there's a lot of common misconceptions that come up with this uh, theme, and I wanted you to sort this out for yourself. Convince yourself that whatever answer you think is the answer is indeed the answer. So if we define uh, our first odd number to be x, and again, consecutive odd numbers are 11, 13, 15, 17, 19, 21, 23, so on and so forth. So the first odd number is x. What do you think the next odd number could be defined as in terms of x? What about the next one after that? And the one after? And the one after that? So fill in these blanks before you start working on word problems. Make sure that you convince yourself that whatever you're putting here is indeed correct and that it matches the jumps that you're taking from here to here, from here to here, from here to here. Don't just write something down and say that, oh yeah, I'm pretty sure I'm right. Make sure that whatever you put here matches with whatever these numbers are. And that's it. So this is uh, all the stuff that perhaps you want to keep in mind for word problems. 
And in the next talk, I'll talk about just plain old equations or what to do once you have the equation itself. Uh, how do you work with those? So if you have any questions, as always, please feel free to reach out. Have a nice day.